and thank you for tuning in with us. Today we will be discussing health and wellness, and I am Lizanne Sliwa. I will be your host today, and we are graciously uh, having Michael, I'm sorry, Dr. Michael Zinsky from England uh, greet us using uh, Google Hangouts. So thank you so much, Doctor, for taking the time to be with us today. Hello, everyone. Very happy to be a co-host of this beautiful conglomerate. So our goal for this show is to share our medical knowledge and to stress upon certain topics that we feel within our community or even our medical experiences that have been overlooked. And to touch base upon that, I just wanted to share a little bit about myself. I am a licensed practical nurse and I currently am the director of the diabetes store in Skokie. And so I have extensive knowledge in, in different uh, aspects of the medical field and um, just wanted to be sure that Dr. Flinsky also shared with you his background and his knowledge and um, why he's in England and why he's not with us actually in the studio. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you for warm introduction. Uh, I am currently in the forefront of the medical pyramid. I am a resident in South Yorkshire in a hospital in Sheffield. And my knowledge comes in a very practical, hands-on uh, sort of way at the moment, and I am more than excited to be able to join with the studio with ARTV and with a close friend of mine, Lizanne, and be able to share some of our knowledge and practical experience about a variety of healthcare topics that we feel are sometimes under stressed in day-to-day -day life, and we will like to shed some light onto the common ailments and preventive methods that we were able to come across during our experiences in the Absolutely. healthcare profession. So one of the topics that we felt was very important right now is in fact allergies, and I know that's a dreaded thing that many people suffer from, and I'm very lucky, in fact, I took my medication today, so I don't sound that bad. So. I um, felt that this was a great thing with the change and spring quickly closing upon us and, and summer um, just you know knocking on our doorstep. And I know many people within my life that are affected by it. And I know that some things are just not known, such as um, what it is exactly and how can people be treated and what can they do to uh, prevent or lessen the cause or, or even what can you do as a loved one to help others and, and also what is a dangerous thing such as anaphylaxis so these are the different topics we will be touching upon and so I would like to first ask Dr. Flinsky if you can actually start off with what exactly is allergies and, and how can one know that they have allergies in fact well I, I, I wanted to start off just by mentioning that this is a perfect topic for the season. We have summertime upon us, and we mainly would like to focus on helping people enjoy their time outside, whether it's with your children or with your families. Be able to be free of a runny nose, free of itchy eyes, etc. And just to answer your question, the very basic, basic definition of what an allergy is, it's a word used to describe an adverse reaction that the body has to a particular food or any substance that you may find in your environment. Interestingly, most substances that cause allergies are not harmful and have no effect on people who are not allergic whatsoever. In a sense, you can, you can feel that it's a little bit of an unlucky situation for you if you do have allergies because other people around you will not be affected by the same things you will. So just a couple words uh, that I would like to define or going into some depth uh, is that any substance that triggers an allergic reaction, uh, we refer to as an allergen or a trigger. Uh, another word that we commonly use in defining allergies is sensitivity. And sensitivity is used to describe um, a normal side effect that's produced by contact with such a substance. So for example, just to, just to use a topic that everyone is very familiar with, an example would be, would be caffeine. A, a 
cup of coffee normally doesn't cause any extreme symptoms such as palpitations or trembling, shaking, but it will in much larger doses. Uh, another word that we need to define is intolerance. And that is where a substance such as lactose uh, can, for example, cause unpleasant symptoms like diarrhea. And people with intolerance to certain foods can typically eat a small amount of it without having larger problems. But in contrast with people that have a food allergy, uh, a person will have a really bad reaction even if they come into contact with a tiny amount of the food to which they are allergic. Um, some, some, in, some common allergic disorders include asthma, eczema, hay fever, um, and an allergy develops in layman's terms is when your body's immune system reacts to a trigger as though it is a threat and it starts defending itself like an infection and during that process it starts releasing histamines and other chemicals in the body which uh, when they get activated to a certain level they can cause a really severe allergic reaction. So once your body gets exposed to an allergen it uses its memory cells to remember uh, exactly what it came into contact with and next time it does uh, become exposed to it, it's going to produce antibodies and the whole cascade of bad effects can can evolve into uh, from a mild reaction to a very dangerous one. And Lizan, now I think it would be a good idea if you could tell our viewers how long does it take to develop an allergy in one's lifetime? Thank you. It's different for everyone in particular but when it does come to the initial reaction that an individual does come in contact with that allergen, nothing actually does occur. Your body identifies it, knows it, stores that information, and then it actually begins to create some kind of sensitivity. So what that means is first time you go outside and you're allergic to pollen, you may not feel anything, in fact, and it will take quite some time, in fact, for you to really develop that allergy. So people are misunderstood by what that actually means. They said, for years I've had a dog, but all of a sudden now I'm allergic to dog hair. Well, it took your body years to develop that, to identify what it was, and for your body to begin to uh, use your um, immune system to actually block it. So oftentimes, and in my profession, I've actually noticed that the rule of thumb is 10 years old. When an individual will actually be diagnosed with an allergy. So for any parents out there, please remember that, that for the 10 year old, usually it's, it's, it's um, the, the age that is oftentimes is when a child will be uh, diagnosed. Now, is that correct, doctor? Is 10 years old usually the age? That's a very good, uh, that's a very good kind of uh, generalization as usually, um, you can identify it in your family whether a child is atopic or to have atopy, which is a term used to, to children that do develop um, reactions and they are usually put into a higher risk and usually that is identified at around the age of 10. Um, environmental factors are actually something that plays a huge role in whether children uh, will have a higher tendency of developing allergies or not. And some of these factors are, are growing up in a house with smokers, for example, if you're exposed to dust mites or pets, or if you're using, if you're, if you're ill during childhood and you are put on antibiotics early on, your body just develops a different immune system and it's more, more prone to uh, developing such reactions. And I think you could walk us through on what what are some of the most common triggers that you, you could tell our viewers that cause allergies. There are so many triggers, but as many of you may know, it will be your your house dust. It will be pollen that is outside. It is your grass, and it is also pet hair and skin flakes. So, yes. It is skin flakes. So when people joke and say you are allergic to somebody, you can in fact be allergic to skin flakes. And it's, it's goofy as it is, but there's even allergies to food, of course. And there's uh, a huge 
um, allergy to bees and wasps. And please be aware, especially now that summer is coming up. And you also have an allergy to certain medications. And when we do go into that aspect, when you are allergic to a certain type of medication, um, that medication itself can also, in fact, um, be used in other medications. So you may not just be allergic to just that name. You will also be, in fact, allergic to other medications that are the subcategory of that or chemically made from that original base. And um, others are, of course, latex. So I, as a nurse, when I walk into your room, I need to know if you're allergic to latex because I don't want to use latex gloves to assist you. And there's even something as simple as household cleaners and even shampoos. So it is um, something to definitely um, be wary of and to be knowledge of yourself and, and everything around you. So, you know, Doctor, what are a few things that our viewers can know to identify what is an actual allergy? How can I know that I'm actually having an allergic reaction or what can I do um, to differentiate that per se than just a common cold? Well, the diagnosis, uh, in my experience, usually begins with awareness inside the home. Uh, usually a mother will notice a trend or a pattern of her children developing uh, any sort of patterns of sneezing or wheezing or any sort of sinus pain, pressure behind the eyes, uh, any coughing or hives, any, any tonsillar swelling, conjunctivitis or itchy eyes, ears, lips, throat, shortness of breath, and even just the propensity with associated vomiting and diarrhea. All of these are symptoms that can be caused by allergies, amongst other things. And it, it's very important to be able to differentiate if these symptoms uh, are actually caused by an allergen or if they're caused by, by any, any sort of other diseases. Uh, so it's always good to, to be aware. And it's recommended in our profession, of course, to um, seek professional help to go see your GP if you do notice these events and patterns uh, to be happening more often than not. If you see these symptoms that are occurring seasonally or when you're traveling and there's a pattern, it's a lot easier uh, just to come into a clinic like Lizanne's or to come into the hospital and get a official diagnosis. And there's a couple of different ways that um, we, we go about diagnosing allergies. The first one is a skin prick test. So you will come into our clinic and we will inject a small amount of these triggers under your skin in safe amounts. And we're going to uh, be able to see to which ones your skin reacts to. And this way we'll be able to identify the specific allergen that happens. And there's different panels uh, that you can go through. Uh, the other one is a blood test where we will be able to, uh, to measure the amount of IgE antibodies in your blood, which are very specific to allergic reactions. And there's a scale that Lizanne and I would be able to interpret for you if you ever come into into one of our establishments. And then the next one, if you if you are prone to developing eczema, which are uh, which are these hot looking rashes on your on your hands in between your, your fingers, on your elbows, behind your knees, uh, you will come in and you will get a dermatitis patch test. Uh, one thing that I don't think Lisa or I would highly recommend is using commercial allergy testing kits. Um, a lot of them have a lower standard of uh, being able to identify the levels. And allergies are a serious thing, and they can cause very serious reactions. So it's something to be serious about. And if you as a parent or uh, just as an individual notice that you are suffering because of allergies, 
it's highly recommended just to come in to a clinic or to see your GP locally and get an official diagnosis. Now, one of the things that uh, we did not touch upon was the different age groups. So for, for these different tests, um, you know, viewers may want to know what would be the best thing for their child or loved one or even their grandparents because somebody actually just sent in a question right now asking uh, what is the best approach to diagnose an allergen in an infant? And that's a wonderful question. So an infant being, of course, just um, just a few days, few weeks old. So, um, doctor, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, well, um, out of all these tests, uh, the skin prick test um, is able to be to be custom fit where even lower doses of the allergens are introduced and uh, there are kits that are able to be used on basically any age group, even say for infants and babies, adolescents, the elderly. And a blood test will very quickly be able to identify a, a, a increased level of specific antibodies. So they're very safe in any age group. Now, I, I did notice that quite a few times you have actually mentioned that, you know, an allergic reaction is very dangerous. Can you tell us exactly what that means in details? Because, you know, somebody may not know. What, is, what does that mean? So, I was kind of stressing that because allergies uh, on their own can cause very mild symptoms. But sometimes uh, a allergic re reaction can escalate up to what we call in the in the medical setting anaphylactic shock, which can be fatal. Uh, usually, anaphylactic shock escalates very quickly, uh, with, within minutes even sometimes, depending on what kind of dose of allergen you were exposed to. So the symptoms are a little bit different than the typical seasonal or um, or just more common allergies. So first of all, you will you will go into a state where your throat and your mouth will swell. You will have extreme difficulty swallowing, sometimes even being unable to speak, very difficult breathing. You can develop a, a rash anywhere in the body. You'll feel warm, you'll feel flushed, your heart will start beating extremely fast. You'll, you'll feel cramps, nausea, even sometimes vomiting. Uh, you can feel a sudden drop of blood pressure and even collapse into unconsciousness. Um, so all of these have a little bit of a different presentation than a more mild allergy. And this is something that we, uh, we really, in our profession, we would love to educate people to be able to identify exactly how to act, how to react, how to even be able to manage a scenario where, where someone is experiencing these symptoms and if someone is at least a little bit aware, they will act accordingly. They will, they will put the patient in a recovery position, whether this is happening outside or inside a clinic where these things can happen anywhere. Um, but these on, of course, you are very familiar with this as well. So I thought maybe you'd be able to uh, to kind of go over which triggers are especially uh, more prone to cause anaphylactic shock as opposed to just more common allergenic symptoms. Absolutely. The more common you'll find for the allergens are insect bites and bee stings, wasp stings, and you will find those coming up now in the summertime. And you have to be very cautious. The area won't just be red and uh, warm to touch. That is usually just your typical bee sting. But just like you know, the doctor explained, you will have all of the other symptoms such as throat closing and you know, a racing of your heart and, and everything else. And the other new, um, I guess, rule or, or the new thing that I now know is in the school system, they are not allowing for peanuts to be allowed into the school at all. So for the precautionary reasons for any child to have a peanut allergy, they now are asking that no child bring any peanuts at all. And so that is 
uh, most often the second most common allergy that could be extremely severe and a peanut allergy um, is very severe and um, it it's, uh, could cause anaphylaxis immediately. And the other, of course, is medication. So um, when a medication is administered or if you are taking a medication, you did not know you were allergic to it, the same thing. You will feel all of these same symptoms quite quickly. So, um, you know, if, if an individual doctor actually feels these symptoms or, for example, if, if I was to go home and take Tylenol for the first time ever and I feel these symptoms, meaning I have a racing of my heart, I have a fever, and my throat begins to feel raspy or almost a bit swollen, what would you suggest I do? Well, first of all, you will you will need to be able to identify the urgency and how quickly you're feeling the symptoms. That's the most important thing. If, if for example, in your life, uh, you felt uh, a similar reaction to a different medication, you might not be immediately as concerned. But if you feel that the flushing, the heart racing, you feel drowsy, even a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, panicked, that's when the first thing to do is immediately to call an ambulance. Uh, if there's anybody around you, you would immediately want to ask them to kind of make sure you're fine and to show them if, if you're unable to speak, of course at that point when, you're, when your throat is closing down, uh, you might need to resort to the sign language and just dial 911 and wait for an ambulance. This is crucially important as it's a matter of life or death in most situations when an anaphylactic cascade begins. Um, in some cases, it's even good that you, as a viewer, will know how to react when you see someone in a position like this. And the most common things to to recommend is to try to keep uh, this person as calm as possible and to put them in a position where their airway is the most open. We usually call this a recovery position where we put a patient on their side with one leg and arm extended and the neck flexed back to, to keep the airway open as long as possible. If the cascade goes further to the point where uh, the person in front of you stops breathing, that's when you need to call for immediate help, see if there's anybody around that, that knows how to start CPR. And this will actually save someone's life while the ambulance is on the way. Um, and if you are a person who's previously experienced an anaphylactic shock, uh, I find it very useful to not only educate yourself as you would be educated um, at a hospital or at a clinic how to use your EpiPen, but also to make your close friends and loved ones aware that you do have this condition and you don't, you can never be positive when the next anaphylactic shock could come or what's going to cause it. So it, it's very important to stay educated and to keep uh, your EpiPens on you, which are little pens with a jolt of adrenaline, which will uh, which we use to uh, to kind of help calm down this reaction. And uh, the most important thing is to stay educated and aware if if you've ever felt this this sort of danger and urgency, and just make sure that those around you are aware and that they know how to react if this if this happens. We just got a question from first generation American and it's asking, can my acne be caused by an allergy? I hear a lot of, um, I hear a lot about gluten allergies causing acne. So um, she's absolutely right. And there is a new identification of the gluten allergy. And um, just to, to speak a little bit about that, gluten is a grain that is most often found in, well, everything. You can't miss it. It's, it's found in everything um, from your bread to your chips to even your shampoo. It is 
it's it's quite crazy how it's actually everywhere and you wouldn't think a grain would actually be in your shampoo but it's everywhere so um dr klinsky would you like to uh answer that question in regards to acne and allergen uh i'm not completely uh in the loop on acne treatment at this point of my career uh however i thought maybe we'd be able to handle this question so for that viewer, we will ask if we could try to get your information and we will definitely answer your question on a later day. And um, fortunately, I don't know too much myself, but what I do know is um, no matter what your body goes through, if it does go through a shock, um, you may actually experience something such as acne because of that. But um, just to be sure we answer your question the correct way, we will get back to you with the proper answer. Um, and uh, I just wanted to go through um, a few very useful tips that I find to help myself and to help my family with lessening the outbreaks of an allergy or even just um, finding myself even, even starting to have the first symptoms. And one of the most important things, of course, is to avoid it. So if you're allergic to peanuts, don't eat that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's quite simple, but it's not at the same time. It's so good. So um, the, other, the other thing, of course, is to make sure that you have medication available. And even if it's just a mild medication, you don't want for it to escalate into something that is unbearable or untreatable. So um, be sure that you do know, of course, that medication will not treat the allergy. And let me repeat myself again. The medication you find at, at your local pharmacy will not actually cure the allergy. You are actually helping stop or cure your symptoms from the allergy. So what you are actually doing is stopping a runny nose or stopping the itchy eyes or all of the other symptoms such as sneezing. So, um, you know, the, um, the different medications that are offered and that you, you may be confused by when you do go into the pharmacy aisle. Um, we, we can touch base upon that, and so we can educate you on what it is exactly you're reading, what it is exactly you may need or may not need. So, um, Dr. Flinsky, would you like to go through the different uh, categories of medications, oral, uh, topical, and what is most often used? Absolutely. Uh, the the golden rule of managing allergies is what Lizan uh, touched upon at the beginning, and of course that is avoiding the causative allergen. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can manage your symptoms. Um, again, these are not recommended to be taken long term. Uh, they're mostly recommended to uh, to go and treat your your ongoing symptoms. Uh, some of the more common ones uh, would be a class of drugs called antihistamines, uh, such as Claritin or Loratide. So like we mentioned before, uh, when your body feels that it's threatened uh, by an allergen, it releases this chemical called histamine, and it basically begins a war inside of your body that results in, in rashes, runny nose symptoms. Uh, antihistamines you can take um, in the form of tablets, creams, uh, there's syrups, there's eye drops or nasal sprays and clearly each one of those uh, is more or less targeted towards what kind of symptoms you're having. Uh, another type of medication over the counter are decongestants and uh, those help to relieve blocked noses typically caused by hay fever a dust allergy or a pet allergy, and they can as well be, t be taken as tablets, capsules, nasal sprays, or liquids. And again, we never recommend any of these to be taken long term as there's no need to ever take any medications that you don't need to be taking. Uh, steroid sprays are used to uh, act on the linings of your airways, and they're effective in suppressing inflammation and tightness that you will feel in your neck or in the back of your throat. Uh, absorption into the body is minimal uh, with steroids, so there's not that many adverse effects with them. 
Um, and I strongly urge our viewers not to heavily rely on medications that are, are coupled with sedatives as they can make you drowsy, sleepy, and even in some cases cause uh, work and car accidents. We um, just received a, another question um, from the same previous viewer and just asking if her, if, uh, her boyfriend has a cat allergy, how can she tell whether or not if it's really an allergy or he just hates her cat? So I, I would hate to find out and, and um, trying to find out I believe would be extremely dangerous. So first generation America, I don't recommend that you try. Um, and it could lead to something as serious as anaphylactic shock. And um, one thing that I have noticed, though, even if you may have cat hair on your clothing, so if he is allergic to the hair itself, if you have the hair on your clothing, um, your boyfriend may actually um, feel uneasy or have these mild symptoms just being around you with having that hair on you. Um, do you have any suggestions? Dr. Flinsky for that one? <laughs> well, it, just when it comes in pets with general, um, it's it's been shown through studies that people are actually not allergic to the hair itself. They're allergic to, uh, to the skin particles that sometimes uh, kind of shed off with the hair and with the skin. And the most potent um, trigger in, in pet allergies is actually uh, cat or dog saliva. So perhaps uh, we could do a, a kitty kiss test and see exactly what happens when he comes into contact with cat saliva. There'll be a clear uh, way to rule that out. Again, highly unrecommended as you don't want to see your boyfriend go into anaphylactic shock. But chances are he's a cat person and I meant to say that he's a dog person and he's just trying to play games. Very possible. So just to recap, um, to not try that, that it would be very dangerous to do a yeah. kitty kiss. Don't try that. Is exactly what the doctor called it. So I uh, do want to uh, welcome the viewers that have just tuned in with us. I am Lizan Sliwa, and this is the Health and Wellness Hour segment with um, myself and as well as with uh, Dr. Michael Flinsky who is joining us in England using Google Hangout. So if any of our new viewers have just tuned in, please send us any of your questions on the chat that is located just on your right-hand side. We have been covering the topic of allergens and allergies, and in particular for the um, summer season that is coming up. So um, the, the other thing that I did want to touch upon was when these basic over-the-counter you know medications doctor don't work anymore well what is a person to do because I know and, and you know better than I do that many people actually take it upon themselves to treat themselves so if they've gone to the pharmacy aisle they've purchased all of this stuff when is it time to finally say okay it's time to go see Dr. Flinsky and Nurse Lizan uh, once you've exhausted your over-the-counter options, um, it's highly recommended, like we mentioned earlier in, in the show, to come in for a skin prick test, for a blood test, or for a eczema patch test. That will help us identify exactly which allergens are causing your problems. And at that point, uh, in a hospital setting or in a clinic setting, we would be able to uh, begin a treatment that we call hyposensitization. Uh, which is also called immunotherapy. Uh, the way that this works is that um, we, we slowly, in a very controlled environment, we slowly introduce uh, a small dose of this allergen into your body, and we keep introducing uh, this amount for a while until you're able to tolerate it, and we introduce a little bit more. And we slowly desensitize your body uh, to this uh, specific allergen. And it's normally recommended only 
for the treatment of severe allergies. So um, hay fever, uh, really aggressive pet, pet allergies, and for specific allergies such as bee stings and wasp stings, which are most common uh, for causing anaphylactic shock. Uh, so this type of treatment can only be carried out under the close supervision of a doctor or a nurse in a hospital uh, because there is a risk that while your body is, is, uh, is being introduced, these levels of allergens, you can develop a serious allergic reaction in the process. So a controlled environment is key. So one of our viewers just asked, would you recommend using natural based products uh, to cure allergies? And um, if, if you were to recommend that, when? When exactly would an individual that just feels that they may have allergies, in what step do you feel that a natural based would be the best option? Uh, well, some some people are able to notice that if they use a certain type of soap, they'll get a skin reaction. If they use a certain type of shampoo or they use a certain deodorant that has any metals or aluminum, uh, you slowly you you slowly realize which products work for you and and which don't. And at that point, some people are even allergic to different uh, to different scents in in various perfumes. Uh, so it's always good to kind of return back to uh, the nature base and see if that helps in controlling your symptoms. It's uh, I'm sure that we'll get into it when we go over some of our kind of uh, general tips on on how to uh, and how to customize your own surroundings to be as hypoallergenic as possible. But but definitely uh, a return to the natural base of things eliminates just uh, by default a lot of potential allergens that exist in the soaps or in the shampoos and in the manufacturing process. So it's just a good way to go and try to have a clean slate and, and stay away from any of these potential allergens. One of the other allergens that we have not really touched based upon or gone in depth about was the dust mite. And this particular allergen is, you know, extremely hard to sometimes even identify because even in the cleanest of homes, you won't even know that you have dust mite. And especially if you're a new homeowner, you don't even know where it is and you just keep having this runny nose, you keep having this allergy and you don't know how to identify it. So a few tips that I would like to go over is to uh, try to choose wood, hardwood floor or vinyl floor. Carpeting actually traps the, that dust and, and all of that moisture underneath. So you want to be sure that you have an exposed, clean surface on your home floor. And you also want to choose to have blinds that are easy to clean, um, such as wiping them down. So more of a plastic material um, or a harder material, not uh, so much of the fabric for the curtains. And as well, to be sure to clean all of your um, children's soft toys to be sure that you wash them in the washer and to also be sure to use them at a higher temperature to kill any bacteria or to kill any uh, dust mites that might be there. And also to, there are special pillows that you may or may not have actually seen that are specially designed for individuals that have allergens and to, to help reduce the, the outbreaks of them. And to be sure to use a HEPA filter in your vacuum cleaner all of these things could be very useful for when trying to reduce the seasonal allergies that many of us suffer with. So um, the, um, I apologize. <laughs> so, so we could go into the, uh, another helpful tip when it comes, uh, and when we touch up upon the topic of pets, uh, a lot of times these allergies take years to develop and once they do it's kind of a very tough situation to deal with especially if you've had an animal for a really long time and you know the whole family's attached and there's there's really no no easy easy way to deal with the situation um, so like I mentioned before uh, most people are not allergic to the fur itself it's usually the dead skin flakes 
saliva or dried urine. Uh, it if you do have a pet allergen uh, at at home, you need to be ready to clean, clean, and again clean. You need to keep your pets outside as much as possible, or if you have an extra room, in, you know, in the house, just to limit them to one room. Uh, you should not allow pets in the bedrooms, as when they shed and they leave the flakes and the saliva, uh, they can actually propagate a reaction that can happen overnight. Even uh, we usually recommend to our patients with to uh, wash their animals um, every every two weeks or bathe. And again, you are going to need to groom your dogs regularly. And you should really take the extra effort to wash all the linens um, and pillowcases and bed sheets at a hot temperature a little bit more often than you used to. Uh, if you're visiting a friend or relative that has a pet, uh, you should ask them counterintuitively not to dust or vacuum before you get there, because that's actually going to stir up all the allergens in the air before you get there, and that's just going to ask you for trouble. Uh, one thing we would recommend is from a over-the-counter treatment is to take an antihistamine an hour or two before arriving in a setting where you know you will be exposed to such uh, to such pets or, or pet hairs. You don't have to remind me. Every time I go to my grandmother's home, I have to constantly remind her to not do that. I know all of us have grandparents that love to cook and love to clean, and my grandmother always does that, so I have to always remind her when I go and visit her. Um, a viewer just asked, what is the best time to uh, actually have an allergic test done? Um, can you... Um, give more um, details about when is the appropriate time. Now, I'm not sure if they're asking about age appropriateness or about when it is an individual suffering from an allergic um, onset or reaction. Well, um, like we said before, age appropriateness uh, kind of goes along the board of all the tests. They're all, they're all made very safe. Uh, usually, it will be uh, the awareness and uh, kind of the desire to change your quality of life. If you realize after some time, summer after summer, your allergies are getting worse and worse and worse, uh, and you're having uh, you're, you're having a really hard time even enjoying time outside. The pollens and the grass and everything is just causing you so much grief. You're sitting at home with a poofy face, with swollen eyes, with a with a runny nose and uh, it will eventually get to you, and there is no no perfect time. But um, as soon as you 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 kind of realize that these allergies are becoming debilitating in your life, that's when you want to come in and and see one of us. And there is really no rule of thumb. As a parent, when you see that your child is developing um, allergic reactions and that you feel kind of scared for their well-being, then as a parent, you will want to take in your child as soon as you possibly can so that you can start managing the allergies further down the line. Um, when it comes to um, asthmatics and people that, that suffer from chronic asthma, uh, in those patients, we would recommend coming in as soon as possible. Uh, you could get diagnosed with asthma in the hospital without having an allergen test done. And I believe this is going to be a topic that we will definitely cover down the line. Uh, but asthmatics have a especially worrisome fate is if you do develop an allergic reaction, you, you can go into asthmatic shock. And again, uh, that can be fatal. So in asthmatics, we would highly recommend to be aware of which allergens uh, are specifically tailored to you. And in those cases, we would recommend coming in as soon as you can. But for everybody else, as soon as it starts getting to you and you start feeling uncomfortable, uh, you're just going to want to come in on your own and kind of know exactly what it is that's causing you all that grief. Absolutely. 
The other food, the other allergy we wanted to touch base upon was food allergies. And by law, manufacturers now have to include every ingredient that may cause an allergy that is in the um, food that they do produce. So that would include um, anything from an egg or celery or even something as such as a peanut. And even uh, manufacturers that may have had that food even in their food distributing line, they will actually state on the bottom of the food label that this manufacturer may have peanut um, traced or you know, a, a, uh, there may be a peanut a source within the candy you're about to eat. So it's very, um, it's very wise to read and educate yourself on what exactly is on your food allergies and learn what is um, exactly in your foods and especially the food you're eating every day. You don't want to constantly expose yourself to the same allergy. And the other thing to also keep in mind as well is when going out and looking at the menu. These menus don't actually have the specific food that is included, especially when you see the different sauces. I myself have a, a slight allergy to gluten. Well, when I go out, I, I can't just say I want pasta sauce. I need to know what the pasta was made out of, and if it's made out of gluten, I can't have it. So it's, it's very wise to ask, or even if you do have time, go on the restaurant website beforehand and try to read what is specifically included. And, and I know it's sometimes troublesome to ask your server all of these questions, but it's for your own benefit. So please don't feel that you're um, you know, doing anything uh, that's out of the ordinary. But um, we do have another question. Um, they're asking what are the most uh, unusual allergic reactions that you've heard of? So that's kind of, kind of fun and quirky. Have you heard of any that are um, unusual? Um, I've come across a couple in my experience uh, in clinics that I've worked in. Um, one was a specific um, ingredient that was found in a, in a shower gel. And without even knowing, this was the first time that somebody purchased the shower gel on vacation um, and they actually uh, developed a full body eczema in a matter of, of minutes. There was no no compromise to their airway, but it was just contact dermatitis all over their body. And another one that was actually really sad, um, a, a young girl came in, uh, she was brought in by her parents, and they used to, they used to always go on Sundays uh, to get ice cream and she slowly developed a allergy to fresh strawberries, which, uh, you know, if you're a big fan of such foods, then, you know, they could be a little bit life-changing if you can't go and get fresh strawberries on your on your weekend Sunday with your parents. A little unusual, but uh, we kind of got down to it that she was allergic to the, to the seeds that were on the outside, not specifically the strawberry itself, which was a little bit unusual. Uh, but there is no limitation to what you could be allergic to as every person is genetically wired differently. Everybody grows up in, in different environments. Um, some people who actually are underexposed to allergens as children can develop uh, more severe allergies later on. So it's good to have a healthy balance of, of playing outside and playing inside just to keep things balanced, but there is literally no limit to what you could or could not be allergic to. That is definitely unusual. And one of our viewers just asked us uh, what are the most common allergies and um, may have tuned in with us just a little bit later. The most common allergies you will find are with peanuts as well as with bees and wasps as well as with medication. So those are the top three that I have seen within my um, experiences and is there is there any other ones you'd like to add other than those three? Um, you you don't really find um, uh, allergies being very common to to latex these days. At least I, I haven't seen a lot of people allergic to, to latex here in England. Maybe that's just a regional thing. Uh, but 
like you said, pollens um, and foods would be the most common. And usually, um, statistic-wise, one in a hundred people uh, will have an allergic reaction to a bee or wasp sting, and then even a smaller percentage of those will will develop a serious reaction. Another one that we haven't really had a chance to discuss would be it would be molds, um, which uh, a mold basically can grow on any decaying matter, uh, both in and outside the house. Uh, molds themselves aren't allergens, but the spores that they make are. Uh, so we could also chime in here and give a couple of tips on homeowners and how they can uh, prevent uh, these kind of uh, spores from infesting their house. Uh, spores are usually released when there's a sudden rise in temperature in a moist environment uh, such as when you, you leave your central heating on uh, in a damp house or when you leave wet clothing to dry next to a fireplace. Uh, again, some things people just, just do because they have a fireplace and it makes sense to, to dry things this way. Yeah, so the best rule would be to keep your home dry and, and well ventilated. Uh, when showering or, or cooking, you want to keep your internal doors closed to prevent damp air for your, from spreading through the house. Uh, you want to use extractor fans and have house filters that collect spores as well. Uh, and do not dry your clothes indoors. Uh, you would want to uh, use a, a dryer. I'm not really positive how many people still dry their clothes outside or inside. Uh, and you have to make sure that you deal with dampness and condensation in your home. And the spore allergies um, also belong to the group of more severe allergens as well. So just a little just a little helpful tip for homeowners on a couple of things they can do to manage that. The other allergen that we have discussed a few times now is the pollen allergy. And pollen is, of course, found in your flowers. So it um, is flower season soon. So you individuals that are suffering from pollen, you need to be careful for this summertime. Um, and one of the helpful things that you could do is when checking the weather report, you can also check the pollen report, which is quite interesting. So you can see exactly what uh, will be that day's pollen and to kind of plan your day appropriately to see if you... So just so you know, a, a, a 10, 10 pollen grains per cubic millimeter is the threshold of high. If it's any higher than that, um, you, you could expect it to be overwhelming if you are allergic to yeah. that. And since pollen is airborne, you need to be sure to protect your eyes. So you've got to wear your stylish Oakley sunglasses and just have them wrapped around. You got to make sure you protect your eyes completely when you go outside. And you got to be sure to keep all of your doors and windows closed from the outside. Because again, since pollen is airborne, it will get right into your home. So even though you think you're protecting yourself, staying in all day, you might actually be doing yourself worse off. And um, to be sure that you change your clothing immediately when you do get home, be sure that you do wash your clothing in a high heat, and to be sure that you shower. Again, pollen can get in your hair, and you might suffer even more. And uh, you want to avoid uh, grassy areas and uh, the field areas that flowers most often are grown. And you want to avoid avoid those areas completely. So is there anything else you'd like to add? And don't mo you shouldn't be mowing your own lawn. So if you're a teenager and your parents are telling you to mow the lawn, you could easily say that you're allergic to pollens. And unfortunately, doing such hard work labor is not, not cut out for you. So I don't know if your, um, if your family doctor will actually write you a prescription for avoiding to cut that grass, but we can certainly try. Um, Dr. Flinsky might be able to write you one, but I don't know how valid it's going to be if it's stamped in England. So I would like to thank all of our viewers and for our first segment of health and wellness. And our topic, uh, just to recap today, was on allergens and allergies, specifically on seasonal. And our next topic we will be discussing is asthma. Mm -hmm. Asthma. So... Um, you need to stay tuned on ARTVChicago.com 
to check out the uh, next few weeks scheduling to see when you um, can check us out. So um, thank you to all of our viewers, and we look forward to seeing you again. So thank you for this wonderful experience. And don't forget to tune in where you can watch these recorded episodes if you happen to miss this one. And don't let yeah. it happen again. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Nefra to starannie dobranych 11 ziół, które przechodzą skomplikowane procesy laboratoryjne. Nefra przesyła impuls i Twoje komórki wkraczają do akcji. Wzmacnia się system immunologiczny. Weź nefrę, a Twój organizm sam będzie zdolny zwalczać stany zapalne i rakowe. Walka z rakiem nie musi być przegrana. Sprzedaż wysyłkowa na cały świat.